The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live on the Autism Network. It doesn't get any better than this, my friends. We're here live this morning with Dr. Temple Grandin and we're excited to welcome her back. I see that Heather has just written in and said that she's she watched the movie uh, for the first time this weekend and it was wonderful. And oh my gosh, how exciting for you because now you're, you're going to be here live with Dr. Grandin. She's got a new book out and we're going to be talking about this, Navigating Autism, as well as the rest of her books and answering questions that you guys have written in. We did ask for questions ahead of time. We're going to give preferential treatment to those, but you can write in in the chat right now and say hello to Dr. Grandin. Um, she will be able to see those messages. We are live right now on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and about a dozen other places. Uh, Traven, our fabulous Traven, is going to show you some of those places really quickly. We are also going to remind you that this show is a podcast. It'll be available later on today as a free download wherever you get your podcasts. Autism Live is the number one rated autism podcast, again, for the second year in a row. We know that that's because all of you like, share, review, and tell other people. You spread the word. So we really appreciate you for doing that. And I know that one of the reasons why you guys love being here is because we have amazing guests and there's nobody better than Dr. Temple Granted. So I'm going to go ahead and welcome her in here. Let's get her in here and use as much time as we can uh, to uh, have her answer questions. Hello, Dr. Grandin. Good morning. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Just fine. I got to start. First of all, loving the shirt with all the dogs on it. Are those particular dogs that you no, have had? No, it was a shirt I bought years ago at a veterinary conference. I love it. What's that's then, where we got it from. I've had it for a long time. It's fantastic. You're wearing it well, too. And you always put enticing things in the background because you know that I, I get excited by what's on your refrigerator. But show our viewers what you have there on your desk because you have some very Well, cool I squishies. thought this was so cute. One of our uh, local companies was giving these out. It's a bull in a suit oh, because it's a bull, go. you know, cattle. I cattle love Cattle wearing a suit. <laughs> He's so awesome. He's truly awesome. I, thought that, I just thought that was just kind of on. But show us what else you've got over there. Well, this is the truck I learned to drive on. This was a squeezy toy that a Colorado credit union was giving out. Wow. Was it and, a stick uh, or was it automatic? That's the actual, it was three on the tree with a horrible clutch. Ooh. And this is the actual color it was too. This is the truck I learned to drive on. So <laughs> when I talk about driving, I, I, I hold this up. And this... I have to get the most unique, weirdest squeezy toy. When people start talking about anxiety, I said, even the oil field has got squeezy toys. And these are great, right? For anxiety. Yeah, I, picked them up at, I picked them up at, con at convent, you know, meetings. Yeah. I love the ones that are shaped like a brain. I've seen that. I, but I, th that one's like common. I, yeah. I, I, I have one of those brains somewhere, but I really liked the, um, uh, and then when I saw that green pickup, that is actually the kind of pickup I actually learned to drive in. That's super, super Miles fun. of driving on dirt roads, and I was just got off a conference. And and one of the things that's holding a lot of, you know, really great people out of jobs is not learning to drive. Well, maybe let's uh, pause this for a second and talk about that. Do you recommend when teaching individuals to drive that they learn on a stick first or automatic? What do you What do you recommend? Well, I think today you don't need to learn on a stick. Okay. I mean, there's the they, they um, you know, that was much more important, you know, back in the '60s when I was learning. Yeah. Um, it's learning to drive. Yeah. And the most important thing is practicing in a very safe place for a long enough time to get the driving into motor memory before you touch traffic. I cannot emphasize that enough. I was very lucky. My aunt's mailbox was three miles away on a dirt road. <laughs> so we, we dealt with a, you know, a manual transmission in the horse pasture. And you know, I don't think you have to learn on a stick. Uh, not now. So you never but, took the mailbox out at your aunt's place? Oh, no, I never took the mailbox out. <laughs> Though I did take a mailbox out one time somewhere else, but not at my aunt's. Um, they, but that was three miles 
and once we we practiced on the horse pasture to learn the to learn the transmission and that was a mess but it was the middle of the horse pasture and then every day for you know six weeks up and back to the mailbox 36 miles a week at wow. 20 minutes a day just about perfect and then we carefully did traffic yeah. driver's ed pushes them into it often way too quickly way well, too I, quickly. I want I'm gonna a lot take more this time down. spent driving in safe places like big open parking lots yeah like a costco parking lot someplace yes. like that a yeah. costco parking lot at six o'clock in the morning when nobody's there exactly that's when I, that's when you want to do it when nobody else is there but I will say you have to be careful because some of those mall parking lots have those concrete blocks with the light. Well, that's that right. With light you don't poles. want those. Well, no. Let's find the ones that don't have light poles. Yes. They, Big, the reason why they have the concrete blocks is so that will damage your car rather than taking out the light pole. Yes, that's the reason I, for the big concrete bases. And I have a friend whose daughter wrecked the car like five minutes into the driving lesson on the on the concrete block so we don't do that uh no, i'm gonna take to i'm that. gonna use this advice because you know my son is in the process of learning how to drive right now so this is this but the is other good fun. the other good place is out in the fields that's another um a good place no i'd like to find a parking lot without the posts okay there we go we're saying good morning uh, a lot of people are writing in greg donna i am one amanda parker valerie michelle uh heather uh everybody's writing in and saying good morning and we we welcome everybody being here i want to jump in to a question that was sent to us by carrie mallory thompson um she wants to know uh what is your take on teaching consequences to a 12 year old boy Consequent, what kind of consequences? Uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of different schools of thoughts on this temple, but, you know, like consequences when you, so if, if, if somebody says, if you do this, then this is going to happen, do you uphold the consequences? How much do you punish? Uh, there are lots of schools of thought on this, but what do you, they want to know what you think. Well, I can tell you, I'm going to just work by specific examples. Um, uh, I kicked a hole in the wall when I was a teenager. Mm. The consequence was spending three days fixing it and the criteria was it must not show mm. and i had to go down and buy the stuff um i had to paint i didn't sand then i have to do it then i'd let it dry then i'd sand I had to paint an entire wall so it wouldn't show now did you already have those skills temple or were you I having actually, to learn no, i kind of had those skills okay but another thing well this is 50s way of dealing with some 12 year olds that broke windows in the school and um, threw dirt and all kinds of stuff into swimming pool, damaged a construction site. They mowed lawns for the entire summer. Mm, okay. That was the consequence. Well, what I like about those consequences are that they're, you know, they're consequences that teach skills instead of just being punishment for the sake well, of punishment. Exactly. And, and I had the skills. Well, let me tell you, it was a ton of work. One, it took like one second to kick that hole. And mm -hmm. um and then you have to like put the spackle tape on and, and you have to, you know, feather the whole thing out. I had to buy the tool to do it with and, um, and then sand it. And then I had to paint the entire wall section. Otherwise and so, so did that prevent you from ever kicking the wall? I never again? kicked the wall ever again. Yeah. I also uh, realized that I kicked it between the studs and if I'd kicked it on the stud, I could have broken my foot. Ooh, well, that's yeah. an important Ooh, thing. It's right. Yeah. Now, I had no way of knowing where the studs were on that wall when I kicked it. Yeah. But I think the thing is, is that you damage something. What happened is instead of they going to juvenile court and all that, they, 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 um, well, the school was state property that they damaged. Um, they just got together and figured out how much money was going to be. And those boys mowed lawns for an entire summer to pay for the damage. Yeah. I think that's the right way to handle it. Well, and, and I do, I love it because what, mowing a lawn doesn't hurt you. It no. teaches you a skill, a skill that, that, you know, you can use as you move forward. So a lot of times I think punishments try to take away something that the child likes. Um, well, one, I think now my one thing I would never take away is something that uses the, air, the, the student's area of strength, like art materials, things like that. Okay. You don't take those things away. You've got to nurture, you've got to nurture strengths. You don't take that kind of stuff away. 
Amazing. Now, endless video game playing, yeah, you might take you know some of that away. But um, you do something where you actually damage something. You know, I kind of like the idea that you do have to pay for it. And fix and it. A lot of lawns I had to mow to pay, especially for the plate glass window at school. Yeah. It was a lot of lawns. There you go. Uh, people are writing in. And you know what I love, you guys, when you write in and tell us where you're watching from? Donna has written in and said that she's watching from Scotland, the place that I most want to go in the world right now. Uh, she says her 20-year-old son is autistic, and um, they just introduced uh, her son to who you are, and they really admire you. So I love hearing from that. Okay, well, but thank if you're, you very much. If you guys are watching, write in and tell us where you're watching from. Latrice says, uh, if my child, who is four, is showing interest in learning Chinese, should I encourage it? He is behind in speech for English. I don't want to confuse him, but I have heard you say that we should foster their interests. And, well, and he's showing interest in Chinese. Well, there's actually some research now that's showing that, that teaching a kid to be bilingual can actually be really a good thing. And I'm going to figure the parents are probably, a, you know, Chinese relatives or maybe they're Chinese. Yeah, go ahead and teach them both languages. Amazing. And that has some definite advantages. There we go. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about this new book, Temple, that you have co-authored with Deborah Moore. Um, and I'm super impressed with this book. I, I, I absolutely loved it. I, I have to be honest with you, Temple. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, but I was saying to you right before we came on the air, what I'm amazed by it is I think this is the best book out there right now in this moment in time for people who are working with individuals on the spectrum. I think it's, you hit exactly the right note, um, in this book, but I love that you included parents and in everything that you talked about, but it's sort of a roadmap for people who are going to work with individuals with autism about it's the nine different mindsets that will help them to be the best possible asset for someone on the spectrum. Um, absolutely loved it. What inspired you guys to write this? Well, I'll be perfectly honest. Deborah Moore came to me and one of the things she's very, very concerned about is label locking. Mm. And I think where this book is most important, new parents, they've got a young new kid. Um, and teachers, new teachers going into the field, new therapists, because it gets to be way too much medical model, medical model. And Deborah Moore made up this term label locking. And I think it's a really, really good term because all they're seeing is the autism and not seeing that maybe the kid's good at art. You know, mother's, mother's very artistic herself. And she saw that I was good at art and she did everything that she could to encourage uh, <coughs> my ability in, in art. And she also broadened it because I was drawing the same horse head over and over again. So let's draw the saddle, the, the stable, broaden, tap into that interest, broaden it. So it's not quite so, so um, fixated. But there's we just had, we just had your mother on the show last week and that's okay, available good. as a podcast. If people want to watch, she's so amazing temple. What an amazing mom you have. Well, she had a very good sense of just how much to stretch me, not force me into some situation I couldn't handle, but, um, like giving some choices. You know, I got thrown out of ninth grade for uh, fighting because when I got bullied and teased and, um, mother had worked as a journalist. Um, for the PBS channel on uh, looking at different schools for kids that had problems. And she visited every special school in New England. And what she did is she picked out three she liked, and then she let me choose one mm -hmm. after we visited them. She I always believed in, in choices, limited choices. When I was afraid to go to my aunt's ranch, she gave me the choice, one week or all summer. Not going wasn't one of them. She said, if you really hate it, you can come back in a week. I got out there and I loved it. I love that. Philip, and it, part of, uh, in keeping with everything we're talking about, Philip wrote in and said, in navigating autism, you talk about the importance of looking at the whole unique yes. individual yes. and getting regular comprehensive evaluations. And Philip says, I agree, but this is hard to get physicians and educators on board for. What do you suggest we do uh, when we get pushback at the doctor's office or at the school? Well, that's too vague a thing. I've got to figure out exactly what the pushback is. You know, one of the big problems is um, 
they get so much into the autism that the kids are not learning basic skills like shopping, uh, ordering food in restaurants, laundry, just very, very basic things like that. I had an allowance when I was seven and I knew exactly what I could buy with that. And certain items were allowance items. Uh, yeah. Candy, comics, and little balsa wood airplanes were allowance items. Well, they never bought those for me. Now, if I wanted that, I got 50 cents a week. If I wanted that 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. Mm. And I'm realizing just how important that was. And then when the parents had a party, this is another thing they did in our neighborhood, easy thing to do. Seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds had to put their best clothes on, greet the guests, shake hands, talk to the guests, take their coats. Yeah. And my brother hated those parties. <laughs> He's not autistic, but you know what? He's, he admitted it helped him to become a senior bank vice president. Of course. Because he felt comfortable talking to older men. Of course. You know, we, we had a dad on the show not that long ago, and he talked about for special dinners, like, because they have multiple kids in their family. Yeah. And so when it was their anniversary, they would have one kid play the mater d. They would pretend their house was a restaurant. Okay. And one one kid would play the mater d, one would be the chef and one would be the waiter and they would take on those roles and they would greet them. And I thought what a wonderful thing to do in your house to get your kids like thinking along those lines. Well, that but these about realizing that just the um you know, my parents would have a party like four or five times a year. Mm -hmm. that this was really important training yeah and the and the thing with having the allowance and 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 it was very clear what items were allowance items popsicles ice cream cones uh candy bars comics uh things like that a uh, coke you buy in the, in the store in the summertime and and county fair rides uh what well, was your favorite ride at the county fair well, it wasn't the Ferris wheel, I'll tell you that right now. Does that make you sick? I had no, I had to sit on a seat that some of the kid had puked on. Oh. But you no. know what I learned from that? What? I went to the Carney office trailer ah. and I got my money back. Oh. I actually did that. that. Uh, that's amazing. So <laughs> what was your favorite ride at the county fair? Well, the well, none of them at the county fair, but at oh when I got older, it was the rotor. You get in this big barrel and it spins around like a washing machine and you get stuck up against the side. I just Temple, love do you ride. love to go to amusement parks? Well, I um, I really liked that ride a whole lot. Another one's called the Roundup. It's now got a, a different name. Well, uh, the next time you come to Los Angeles, let me know. We'll take you to Universal Studios. And they probably got some new things. Yeah, they definitely have some new things. We'll take okay. you there. Um, uh, well, I, I turned to this page in the book because I just think that this is so enlightening. I've never heard anybody else talk about this in the way that you do here. Um, there's a section because each one of the different principles, this one is every child is more than autism. Love this. This is a mindset that we all need to have, but I, I love, you've got a couple of pages here of how professional training might limit your perspective. And it's just this wonderful thing by category, psychiatrists, psychologists, educators, and it talks about how it might be limiting your thinking about this individual. I just think this is amazing. To I think that's really, really super important because what I'm seeing with the labels, especially with fully verbal kids, I think the labels hold them back. Oh yeah. A lot of times. And then where the label really helps a lot is an older person getting diagnosed later in life and their marriage is a mess. That's when the label gives real insight. But this is, you know, another example of the, of the label locking, you know, yeah. they just, um, because I don't, I'm not a verbal thinker. So I'm thinking of skilled trades people I've worked with people that own gigantic metal working shops, people that were laying out entire factories on a one semester class at a community college drafting um, that, um, you know, were definitely were autistic. Yeah. And they were designing and doing very high level stuff. Yeah. But if you get label playing, locked, you're not going to. He's playing video games in the basement. And what's happening right now is the metal working shops, the, the new little ones are not forming. Yeah. They're not forming. The only exception to that because a lot of schools have taken out the shop classes. Well, I can, don't get me off on the, on the loss of skills from taking out shop classes. 
But you'll be excited about this. I don't know if you've heard about this. There's a new initiative to teach um, certain individuals on the spectrum CNC. And there's a whole training program for teaching them CNC. There's a... Yes, um, and I think that's really good. Yeah. You see, there's kind of kind of two sides of things. There's the more mathematical side of things. And then there's the me- mechanical, you know, yeah. mechanically clever side of things. Now, my kind of mind is going to work on the mechanically clever side of things. Well, since we're talking about the different kinds of minds, I mean, you've got, you had already written um, books about this. Um, and I'm, let's take a second to show all the books that you've got there on the desk. Because I keep talking about this one, which is the new one. Which well, is I've got a new version of Thinking in Pictures. Oh, how pretty. New I like that. Book. Book. I yeah. also have to talk about a book that we've just turned into the publisher called Visual Thinking by Temple Grandin. Ooh, and okay. in that, I'm going to be going into the um, science behind visual thinkers like me, pattern mathematical thinkers, the, the visual spatial, and then the word thinkers. You have object visualizers, visual spatial, and then verbal thinkers. And it's available for pre-order right now on Amazon. Just type in visual thinking by Temple Grandin into Amazon. It's taking pre-orders because this gets into a lot of my concerns on how industry is losing out on skills that they need. Yeah. And and there's a lot of autistic people that have these skills. And then of course there's my way I see it book. Mm-hmm. In other words, navigating autism is the book you read first to get you in the right mindset. This has a lot of very so, uh, how-to little chapters like driving's addressed in here, for example, what I told you about driving mm-hmm. or the how-to book. And then I have my books to get kids outside, like the outdoor scientists, get them off the video games, get them outside, get them doing things. Um, this is the uh, Calling All Minds. That's my child's projects. Because we've got kids today that have never made a paper snowflake. Yeah. That are not doing things this basic and i think it's a a really big problem it's that's an amazing book because especially you know we all want to have fun things to do with our kids they're going to help them learn and grow and and i love uh i love that book for all it's it's projects that you can be doing with your kids to find people write in more than anything else the question they have for you temple is how do i find what my kids passion is how do i find what they're good at um and i would think using that book to just go through some of the projects that would definitely be helpful the the other big thing is exposure yeah i have looked into how careers got started for lots of different people it starts with exposure even someone like michelangelo it started out with exposure to great art. Every church was commissioning it and growing up with stone cutting tools. Then later on, you get the mentoring. But how did I get interested in cattle? I got exposed to them in high school. Yeah. It's that simple. You yeah. don't get interested in something you're never exposed to. This is why I'm very concerned that so many schools have taken out art, sewing, woodworking, theater, music. How can you know if you're good with a musical instrument if you'd ever tried it? I tried a little flute and that did not work for me, but at least I got exposed to it. You've got to expose kids to lots of different things and then you'll see what they kind of gravitate towards. I had never heard of this until my son was little, but every once in a while, now certainly it's probably different in COVID, but I'm hoping that things are going to get better fast. Um, They have something called a musical or or, um, orchestral petting zoo and you go and they have tables set up and there's sanitizers and everything, but the children get to go from table to table and try out like 13 different instruments. It's so amazing because cool. you quickly, oh, well, but you I see, like but that, That's wonderful because yeah. you, you have to get exposed to stuff to get interested. And yeah. that's true for every career. I mean, a lot of kids become a doctor because dad was a doctor. Okay. But even that, that's exposure. Michelangelo, um, there, his dad wanted him to be a lawyer, and he goes, yuck. Um, yeah. Don't want to learn Latin, drops out of school at age 12. Yeah. Um, well, but but I think you're absolutely right, because I, one of the instruments they had there was a harp. 
And I, I never was given the opportunity to sit down and play a harp. And they're so expensive. It's not like you say, oh, I'd like to play a harp and your parents are going to go buy you a harp. No, um, but to be able to sit the kid there and have them play it, you you know, we might be missing out on some beautiful harpists in life by well, not this, giving them the opportunity. You, a lot of kids today are not growing up getting exposed to enough different things because they get asked all the time. I got involved in the cattle industry. I, I grew up in the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts. Mm. There was no cattle around there. Yeah. And um, that was out on my aunt's ranch. I, yeah. I, you know, kids are growing up today never using a tool. Yeah. I'm seeing 16 year olds still playing with Legos because tools were never introduced. That kid probably should be working out in a shop building stuff for industry. Yeah. Unfortunately, parents don't always know where to find that stuff. But um, most of the hardware stores, the major hardware stores have Saturday morning workshops That's at least right. once a month that you can go. The tools are all free. They give you the kit for free and they help you mentor your child through putting the thing together. I loved those. Um, that's a great way, you know, if you look and find, you can find things like that pretty much anywhere that are free because not well, you look at someone money. like Steve jobs. He was playing around with electronics next to our neighbor's garage. Yeah. That's where he started out. Well, one of the questions that somebody wrote in has exactly to do with this. They were taught, let me see if I can find it. They were talking about their child taking things apart. Oh yeah. That's kind um, of and that, um, I'm not going to find it here. Uh, my son, my it's Abby. My son eight is obsessed with the moving parts of anything. I have to lock up the toaster or he will take it apart. How can I feed his desire to understand what things do without losing all of my appliances or risking him hurting himself? I should add that he takes the things apart, but shows no interest in putting them back together. Oh, what I would do is is get some old vacuum cleaners or something like that, and he can take them apart. But I want to encourage the putting back together. In other words, maybe take a couple of parts off and then learn to put it back on. Another thing he has to learn that when you take a motor apart, for example, lay the pieces out in a line in the order you took them off, mm -hmm. and then they go back on in that in that same order. Oh, that's smart. But let's, in, let's get some things that can be his stuff to take apart. I talked to one family. Their boy was, I don't know, in his teens. He was going over to houses and stealing the electronic box for the internet cable off of people's houses. Oh. And uh, they didn't know what to do about this. The neighbors were not happy about this. Yeah, well, of course not. The TV wouldn't work. The internet wouldn't work. <laughs> I suggested that they get him some, buy some ca these, these junction box things. Buy some of them. And let him have his own. Yeah. And that stopped it. I that's I wonder if we could teach that kid how to make solar panels, because that would be useful. Well, <laughs> you can install solar panels, not make yes. them. Yes. Install. Well, uh, I keep seeing on Pinterest they have these ways where you can make a solar panel out of Coke cans. I don't know if well, it's true. that's gonna be difficult. And I, I'm, I'm I'm concerned about fires with oh, okay. Well, we don't want to uh, do that. They need to be professionally uh, made. Okay. But he could certainly learn to work for a company that installs solar panels. There you go. I got to pause for a second. There were a whole lot of people that we've had on the show this month that wanted to say hello, that you've been on their shows. So Maya, uh, who does Hello with, uh, World with Maya, she wanted to say hello to you. Sarah wanted to say hello. You were on her podcast and you talked about translucent uh, products for better learning. And she wanted you to know that Simon Majumber from the Food Network, he's a chef at the Food Network. Because of that interview, he started using clear pots and pans to demonstrate cooking because you said that that would help with education. Translucent. Well, they, if you can see stuff that you it, see stuff. Another thing I've talked about, some people have visual processing problems. Yeah. And when they go to read, they see the print jiggle on the page. They have problems with certain types of LED lights flickering and making mm. the room sound be like a strobe light. I have to change the lighting. When, when people ask me about environmental problems in an office, big number one's lighting. Yeah. And that's a has to be fixed. Um, but there's some individuals that if you print the, um, the work on, uh, on like here, there's like the back of this book's pale lavender, mm -hmm. uh, print the work on maybe pale lavender, pale tan, uh, pale gray, 
you know, pale green or pale blue papers and you let the kid pick the paper, I, I've seen that save um, college degree, college careers. And nobody That's, knows why that works, but um, it sometimes does. And you're talking about something that's totally safe. Yeah. Might might cost you five dollars to try it at the most. Yeah. And you'll know in fifteen minutes whether it works. It's interesting, Temple, because when I used to teach, we had students who had dyslexia, and we would get those clear clear that's plastic right. sheets and colors and put the put it over the already printed that's, sheet. That's the same thing. Yeah. That's the same thing. Um, they tend to get worn. Um, sometimes yeah. it's easier just to buy reams of paper and print, print the book on the on the paper. Um, but the but the, those overlays sometimes work. And yeah. nobody really knows why these things work, but in your brain, you see back here in the brain, there's circuits that for color, shape, motion, and texture. And then the mm -hmm. brain has to create a graphics file out of that. Uh, something's wrong with that system. And all they know is when strokes damage it, you get weird things like maybe stop motion coffee pouring like that. Ooh, interesting. Fascinating. Uh, now, we also want to say that if, if people don't get enough of you here, you are going to be on the very next Ed Talk that is by the Ed Asner Family Center. That's going to be on April 26th. They're doing the best of autism on that day. And Temple, you're going to be there as a part of that live Ed Talk, along with the amazing Chelsea Darnell is going to be there as, as well as Chelsea does the movie talk with Chelsea Darnell. She's amazing. And Izzy Paskowitz um, from Surfers Healing will be there as will, I will be there representing Autism Live, but we're letting people know that you will be there. It's the first time for you being at an Ed Talk at the Ed Asner Center. I'm excited about being there with you. Are you excited about that, Temple? Yep. I guess go make, I'll check it on my calendar. Yeah, it's there. Um, but we're really excited about that. If you guys want more information about that, you can go to edasnerfamilycenter.org. Um, it is on April 26th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So that's 6 p.m. Mountain time. And what does that make it? 8 p.m. Eastern time. I'll let you guys do the math on it. But uh, we'll be excited to be there with you, Temple. Okay. Um, in in the in this book, you say that parents are equal team members. Do Absolutely. you see a trend? I feel like I'm seeing a trend of parents who kind of now that we have so many autism centers where they can drop their kid off, I'm seeing a trend of where parents are thinking that this is just something you drop your child off and you don't get involved. Are you are you seeing that? Um, sometimes I might see that that's not good. One thing my mother did, my mother and the teachers at my school were always on the same wavelength. And my mother and the third grade teacher, every, you know, several times a week were talking. Um, no, I think parents are a very important part of the team. Now, I've seen a lot of parents asking me, well, what am I going to do? I've got my school's having a meeting about my child. You know, what am I going to do? Um, there's some that tend to delegate, but no, the parents need to be involved in it. No, they are part of the team. And I think that's very important. Amazing. Uh, we were talking about the mailboxes earlier, and Jacob said that his old neighbor accidentally ran into his mailbox, but that's how they got to meet them, and, and now they're all friends. So Okay, just, well, that's... I just wanted to say that was good. Okay. Uh, one of the things that you stress in the book is how pivotal sensory issues can be in the education system, that it can make or break success. And I wanted you to talk just a little bit about why understanding an individual's sensory issues are so important, especially when we're trying to get them to learn. Well, I already talked about the lighting issue. Yeah. And uh, the old fashioned fluorescent lights that flicker, they bring, they're being phased out. Now I want to emphasize, not everybody with autism has this problem. But I'm going to guess, like, say, an elementary school classroom, you might have 15 or 20 percent of the kids that might have this problem, and the others don't. Now, one of the ways that you can screen for that is if the child is terrified of escalators. Most kids love escalators. I love them uh, when I was a child. Um, they, they, uh, that's a sign that there's a problem because they can't see how to get off the, uh, the escalator. Also, you ask them if they ever see the print jiggle on the page. And if they do, then we got to look at the lights in the school and do the lights flicker. Now, if you're in a school with big windows, 
maybe you can turn the lights off and put the desk over by the window. If you don't have big windows, you're going to have to change the lighting. This is one of the few things that for certain individuals is a has to fix because it's flashing like a strobe light. Yeah. Well, and, and of course, Dr. Stephen Shore, he talks about that he went in to start teaching college and the only way he could do it was by wearing a build hat. Well, wearing the hat blocks, the most of those lights are on the ceiling. So wearing yeah. a hat helps to block it. That can sometimes help. No, he's absolutely right about that. Now, it's one thing to go in and teach a single class in that room compared to being in that same room all day. You see, in college, you're usually moving around in different rooms. Yeah. But that's yeah. Um, that can be a very big problem for some people. Um, and it can uh, prevent you from being able to learn or to well, teach. You can't learn if the room's flashing like a, you know, like some yeah. kind of strobe light thing. Um, sensory problems, noise in the cafeteria. Now, some noises, you can help it if the child in, um, controls the noise. There was one boy terrified of the buzzer on the scoreboard in the gym. Mm. So they took him down to the gym when no one was there and let him play with the button, turning that buzzer on and off. And he started playing tunes on that buzzer. <laughs> so that is where they control it. When I was in first grade, I was terrified of Mr. Russell's gigantic vacuum cleaner with a gigantic bag. Well, I'm sure it wasn't that big, but when you're kindergarten and first grade, it looked, um, it looked really big. Well, yeah. one of the ways to have gotten over that would have been to let me turn it on and off and watch the bag deflate and inflate. That might have gotten me over being afraid of Mr. Russell's vacuum cleaner. There you go. Uh, Anthony had written in and said uh, it's World Autism Awareness Acceptance Month. What kind of work do you want to see to improve more um, in order to support our autism community? Well, that's kind of um, kind of vague. It's big. Yeah. Um, you know, parents ask me all the time, new parents, where do I get help? I always suggest uh, contacting a local support group, parents in the community. Um, then they're going to know what the resources are in that community because I can't know the resources that are in every community. Yeah. And then I also recommend some of my books, you know, Navigating Autism, the Way I See It. Those would be books I would recommend to um, parents of a three-year-old. The other thing I run into a lot, especially in the low income areas in certain parts of the US where there's no services. You got a three year old that's not talking. And they might have to wait two years for a diagnosis. And I tell them, don't wait. You already know he doesn't talk. And his behavior's um, not really so, you know, he's really different. The worst thing you can do is wait. So I suggest for them to get some of my books, the way I see it's one of them. And and get a grandmother's in the community, start working with this kid now, because the worst thing you could do is nothing. Yes, I'd rather have them get into professional thing right away, but if it's not available, yeah. the worst thing you can do with a two-year-old is not talking, is nothing, and just let them play with the phone all day. That's what you don't do. You've got to get I, them interacting, and what I have found is some people have the knack to work with these kids, and some don't. Yeah, it, it's, I think they're born with the ability, regardless of how much training they have. Yeah, I agree with you. But I sort of want to, you just said something that I kind of want to crochet into pillows, which is, and, and show them to people all over the place, which is the, you said the worst thing that you can do with a three-year-old that's not talking is nothing. Yeah, let I them sit all day zoning out on electronics. That's the yeah. worst thing you could do. Yeah. So you better uh, ain't doing something. Angel wants to know, how did you learn to handle the sensory things that bothered you? Do you still have sensory things that you can't stand? And what do you do to help yourself when you're at work? Well, I um, kind of wear the same kind of clothes all the time. So work clothes and good clothes feel the same. I have to find pants that don't itch. That sometimes is challenging because I can't stand on a plane for three hours. My mm. pants itch. It really drives me crazy. Uh, they... The, um, let's look at the different problems. Um, there's visual problems, sound problems. Now, the thing with the headsets, if you wear a headset all the time, it will make the hearing more sensitive and worse. Mm. And so what you want to do is have it with you, but try not to wear it. Now, there's some, you can sometimes do some things to desensitize some of these things, like letting me play with the vacuum cleaner might have helped me to not be so get desensitized. I find clothes that don't itch. Like for women right now, they've got all these little leggings. Oh, I would have loved those. Okay, okay, so you just let the kid wear leggings every day and get four or five pairs of them in different colors and wear leggings all the time. 
at because oh i love leggings i sleep in leggings oh wonderful um larry says i'm on the spectrum and i have a degree in community planning i cannot get a job in my field i get interviews but i know i come across as being different and then i don't get the job i don't know what i'm doing that is wrong and i'm very frustrated what should i do well, you see, the way I sold the job, since I had I had the kind of job where I, could, I had a lot of portfolio I could show off. Like, here's some of my drawings. This picture of one of my jobs. There's a drawing. And so the way I did interviews, since I had things to show off, was I'd show the drawings and I'd show the pictures. And when I was in high school, I had a little sign painting business, and I had pictures of my signs. And that's how I sold the jobs. An interview for me was lay the drawings on the table, put the pictures on the table. And then I wrote for our state farm magazine. And I, and when I turned in my first article, I had a good first article. There's that scene in the movie where I go up and I get the editor's card. I saw that back door. I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would really, really, really help my career. Yeah. And then I delivered a decent article. Now, community planning, I'm, I'm, that it, hope. I know somebody that got a job laying out meat factories. He'd taken a one semester class in computer drawing. He showed an engineer at the plant a homework assignment he had done. And that got him the job? That got him the job. I yeah. worked with one jobs. Well, I've heard you tell people before having an electronic portfolio that you can carry with you everywhere. You need to do that. You need to have an electronic portfolio. I had to carry around a big notebook. But now you'd want to have this stuff on electronic, electronic uh, portfolio, where you can show the you know uh, where you can show the work, the drawings, the pictures, or yeah. let's say your programmer, where you could show off you know two paragraphs of your best code. Yeah. Not a whole book full of stuff, where you could just whip it out and and show it. Well, I love that temple because I think a lot of times uh, interviews are about trotting out social skills that we don't that none of us no, no, really use anymore your tech job she now again this guy showed the drawing he had done it was a water valve that's what he's mm. done drawing up um i uh, he showed it to the engineering department not hr right you've got to show that work and i learned that a long time ago on um, i you either sent it to the president or you sent it to the engineering department there you go because okay. those are the people that would recognize it it's important Okay. Sonia wants to know, my daughter is 16 and I've been told that we should start the conservatorship conversation. I want to keep my daughter safe, but I also want as much independence as possible. What do you recommend? She's 16 and verbal, um, but she is not safe and a little boy crazy, mom says. Well, they, of the other thing, at 16 years old, I hope she has a job this summer. Okay. I want to start the transition from school to work long before they graduate starting with chores at home volunteer jobs churches farmers markets community centers around 11 and 12 instant illegal real jobs and we've got to be careful not to throw them into too much multitasking because they can't handle that yeah. let's learn driving we already talked some about that that's going to take longer but let's learn how to work yeah you know let's see the thing about autistic people they're a bottom-up thinker you got to fill the database so if she gets out and she gets a job, um, you, I've had parents say, well, they just blossomed. Maybe she's yes. not going to need a conservatorship. Yeah. Now, if they're nonverbal, yes. Yeah, yeah definitely. You see, well, this is where I have to have more, more information. Yeah. But I do want to say, Temple, that, you know, it's, maybe everybody isn't going to drive. Maybe every individual isn't going to drive, but I think more people could be driving. But... But what I've learned from you and from people like Joanne Laura from Autism Works Now, that everyone deserves to be able to have a job. Everyone. Yeah, and, I would and there's agree. just different levels of jobs. There's different levels of jobs. And the other big problem I'm seeing is I've, a lot of uh, people that work on getting people jobs don't differentiate where bagging groceries would be a training job for me as a stepping stone, something else. And for some other individual with more intellectual challenges, it is a suitable career. There we and go. it's a useful job. It's, you know, people need it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, didn't we learn that in COVID? Oh, my goodness. Um, Sarah says there's there's more and more discussion about the way autism presents in women, that it is different than in males. I would love to hear your thoughts on how it presents in women. It's usually not as obvious. 
And I know there's been a lot of problems with women getting into relationships that were abusive because they just were so anxious for a relationship. And I think they need to be warned against that. Yeah. Uh, well, an important thing to be warned against. Becca says, do you find it easier to be friends with people on the spectrum? Is it different for you? And in what way? I find it's easiest to be friends where there's a shared interest. You know, whether it was horses, whether it's construction, cattle, industry stuff. Because I have a lot of friends who shared interests that are not autistic. But I also had people, especially when we were building these big jobs, that I was friends with that were autistic. It's um, friends who shared interests, I think, is really, really super important. I guess I want to ask a follow up to that because I was recently at a conference and there were two people on the panel who um, were individuals on the spectrum and they were talking about how when they talk to each other, they feel free to just do like a data download with each other that where they will just they'll call each other and they'll talk and they'll just dump information and they know to be patient while the person dumps information because they're going to get their turn. And there were many people who were like, oh, that's so incredible. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, is it that, is there an element of when you know that you're with someone on the spectrum that you feel a little less concerned about how you're wording something or how long you talk about something? Do you feel freer to talk about things when you know it's another individual on the spectrum? Well, sometimes, but I usually feel freer when I know it's somebody with a shared interest. Like I was on a plane just really recently, sat next to a lady construction manager. Oh. We spent a two-hour flight discussing tilt-up warehouse construction, how to prevent it from being damaged during storms, and it. concrete forming systems. You must have had it. It was we a great flight. Both super interested in that. I mean, it was two construction geeks talking to each other on the plane. It was a great flight. I and love I don't, it. I don't think she was autistic. There we go. Uh, Sansa wants to know, did Temple watch Squid Game and what does she like to watch? Did you watch Squid Game? Well, I read about it. I go, ugh, this sounds so nasty and horrid. I'm not going to watch it. There you and go. Concerned... What do you like to watch? Well, I, um, you know, I, I loved Star Trek. Yeah. I still like to watch old Star Trek. The thing is, a lot of the TV shows that I grew up with, they had very good values about right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And things like Squid Game, the reviews, what it told, oh, this is so hard. Why would he even want to watch that? Yeah. If you play a game where you're going to get killed. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, no, I, I don't need need that. Um, there there's a lot of things where I read the reviews. And I do read the reviews. And I read a lot of reviews about movies and stuff. You know, I uh, some of the Batman movies have just gotten too dark. Yeah. I like the old, more fun Batman movies where Arnold Schwarzenegger was Mr. Freeze and <laughs> Poison Ivy and stuff like that. There we go. Um, they, there's a, in, a meanness in, in some entertainment today that yeah. I just don't like. I just don't want to watch that. Well, I have to, I don't like that either. Um, but I have to say there's other, what they call K-drama that I'm finding that all of the sort of writing that we're missing from the 50s, 60s, and 70s television has all moved to K drama, and it's it's some and it has good morals. I I kind of like a temple. Okay, uh, well that that's good. And there was a very good um, you know um, Picard Star Trek sequel that's been playing. That I thought was really good. Are you, so you've been watching Picard? That was going to be my next question. Yeah, but I've watched some episodes of that. I've only seen one episode. Should I invest in more? Is it good enough? Well, I think it is good enough. Okay. I happen to love Patrick Stewart. So Yeah, and 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 that and it it brings up some um, ethical issues. Um you see, and that's something that the original Star Trek did. And and I'm you know, when I'm very glad that I grew up watching TV where there was very clear things about right and wrong and good good and bad just in a very concrete way and not yeah. being mean. Exactly. We don't we don't need more meanness in the world. Yeah, this is a thing I just don't like in some of this stuff. I read some movie reviews and I go, nope, we're not going to that. Yeah, I'm and I, I that. when I watch a movie or a TV show, I want to care about people. I want to like the people and I want to care about them. And it seems like there's a big thing with the anti-hero now, where well, it's a, I, a bad think, person and we're supposed to like them. I don't get well, it. Well, no, and I I uh, think that's confusing to autistic kids. There we go. Never really. I think it's important to. Uh, 
you know, you know, Superman, the old original Superman, goes very, very clear, right and wrong in that. Absolutely. And and I, I was brought up with that. I'm glad I was. There you go. I, I, you just reminded me, we had a dad who was on the show a couple of weeks ago. He's an autism dad who is a computer engineer. He's written a book called Apollo Autism. Did he get that to you, Temple? No, I don't think so. I think you might like it. Yeah, I think I know. I've never heard of I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's a fiction uh, book about um, about the Apollo program that that goes. Um, there's a there's a dad whose child is being diagnosed uh, and he's working on the Apollo projects. So, so we'll have to get that to you. See. If oh, you no, like. I haven't seen it. I've never even heard of it. OK, it's called Apollo Autism. We'll make sure okay. that Alex it's Alex Philstein. We'll make sure that he gets a copy of that to you. OK, you can send that to Cheryl. Um, cause you, uh, we know that you are a fan of NASA and everything to do with Na- oh, NASA. Yeah. I'm a very big NASA fan. I've been to many of their facilities. So I totally uh, geek out on visiting uh, NASA facilities. Well, and you, uh, you probably remember, I got to go with you the one time. You, well, yeah, got- you got me into Houston. Oh <laughs> yeah. That was so much fun. You got to go in the control room. Oh, that was so I still have the footage from that temple. I got to find time to edit it into something. We're going to make a mini doc at some point. Okay. No, that was um, just horrible. Thank you for taking me there. Oh, temple. It was, it was yeah. the pleasure of my life. Are you kidding me? Um, to be with you and like four or five astronauts all day and just follow you and astronauts around it was, and one of them was a veterinarian who was yeah. an ast. Oh, that no, was, that was good. That was a pretty good day. Um, I know we're running out of time because you have a class that you have to go teach. Um, but there was there was another question that I had and I can't find it. Um, but let's take a second to talk about the books again, because this one is the new one that's out right now. But tell them again about the one that's available for pre-order that they can get on Amazon right now on visual thinking. It's, the title is Visual Thinking. Now you need to put in Visual Thinking Temple Grandin because there's some other things on Amazon with visual thinking in the title, visual thinking temple Grandin. And in this book, I go further into the different kinds of minds. Uh, in my book, the autistic brain, I had some of the initial research in the autistic brain. I had some of the initial research, but this goes deep into the literature that shows that object visualization, like what I have, which was shown very nicely in the movie, Yes. And visual, spatial, pattern, mathematical, music, mus- musical, or actually two different kinds of thinking. And then also studies on word thinking. I also talk about, I'm very concerned about lost skills in industry, all kinds of industry. I'm concerned with the way our educational system, strict algebra requirements actually now in California would screen me out of high school. Um, I talk about how visual thinkers are needed in engineering to prevent really serious disasters like Fukushima, for example. Watertight doors would have saved it. Mathematician doesn't see the water flood in the site. Visual thinker does. Um, and, but we, um, anyone, I think a lot of people are gonna be interested in this. Also, I discussed the jobs for different kinds of thinkers. That's also discussed some in the autistic brain. Um, but, um, I think we really need to be working on this because I'm concerned that verbal, totally verbal, very abstract, overgeneralized, kind of taking over the school systems. Yeah. And we're losing, we're losing skills. I mean, right now, if you want to build a poultry processing plant, how about a hundred shipping containers from Holland, a high wage country? It's because they haven't taken their skilled trades out. Wow. You know, we need some of these kids who think differently. And this is a very important conversation. You you delve into this a little bit in this book where you talk about the different uh, brains. But That's then right. what I loved is that you give examples of here's, you know, here's what it looks like when the child has this kind of thinking. And here's how you would be the most effective at educating this brain. And here's how you could be ineffective by by teaching to them in the wrong way. Let's look at math kids, for example. One big mistake that people make, uh, verbal thinkers make, is make the math kid show his work. That's not how their mind works. Yeah. They think in a totally different way. I've run into this one over and over and over again. It just frustrates the smart math kid that ought to be moved ahead in math. Yeah. And then mother always encouraged my ability in art, using different media, doing many, many different things. 
that was really important. You want to take that thing they're good at and expand on it. Absolutely. You know, of course, I grew up using tools. Visual thinkers like me, it's going to be art and mechanical things, building things. Uh, and then also things like graphic design, photography. Those are another, and animals. Those are things that my kind of mind are good at. They Wonderful. Together. I have one last question from for, for you from Holden. Holden wants to know if you could meet one person and have lunch with them, who would it be and why? Oh, I'd like to have lunch with Elon Musk. That would be I, 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 I was betting on that. I thought, yeah. and why hasn't Elon Musk met you and had lunch with you yet? I don't know, but I, uh, I watch all the stuff. I, when he did the first SpaceX trip up the space station, I geeked out on like three hours of live feed going to the space station. I watched the whole thing. Yeah. You know, well, that, he, he um, needs to, he's, he's not uh, buying Twitter now, so he needs to find time to put you on his schedule to have lunch. Of well, course, we would want to be there to have uh, cameras, but we would not be there. Um, you would want to have a lot of emphasis on the importance of manufacturing. Yeah. When he gives a tour of his car factory, you can see he loves his car factory. Oh yeah. He is what he does. You yeah. see, this is why like, people are th talking all the time about identity. It's important for me to have, interesting career is really important. Now, I hope my, I think my big purpose is to help the younger people um, be everything they can they can do and get out and have a life and get out and have good careers and yeah. contribute. Amazing. So I know you have to go uh, to teach a class, but we want to remind everybody that if they want to see more of you, they can join us on the 26th of April, the Ed Asner Family Center. Dr. Temple Grandin will, I can't even say your name anymore. Dr. Temple Grandin will be there live on the 26th, the Ed Asner Family Center. You can see teafc.org. I will also be there as will Ch Chelsea Darnell, Izzy Paskowitz, and of course, Nava. Paskowitz, Asner, and Matt Asner will be there as well. So we'll look forward to that temple. You're amazing. We're encouraging everybody to go get which all of your books, but whichever one they, they need right now, everybody's saying thank you and amazing books. Um, they can go to Future Horizons to get your book, um, fhautism.com, or is it org? Yeah, no, no, it's .com. .com. And then there is, there's also templegrandin.com. Com, correct? Yeah, I've got, my, I've got books on there and I've got a lot of livestock books on grandon.com. Grandon.com is livestock and temple grandon is dot com is autism. Okay. Well, we're moving in. This is the last time that we're going to do this from home, Temple. We're finally moving into our new studio. The next time you're in LA, I'd love for you to come see our studio. And the invitation is open. We'd be, we'd be happy to take you to Universal okay, Studio. Okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm going to leave the studio now because I've got to go All get right. Teach a class. Thank you, Dr. Grant. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Just reminding everybody that throughout the rest of the week, we've got a pretty big week here. Um, tomorrow, it's Ask Dr. Doreen with Dr. Doreen Grampiche, answering your questions live and in real time. On Wednesday, if the schedule permits, because you know actors sometimes get pulled away, this is huge, you guys, Kobe Bird is scheduled to be with us on Wednesday as long as he doesn't get work on Wednesday, which, you know, if he got work, then we'd be happy for that too. And we'd reschedule. Um, but we are hoping, you know, fingers, I don't know whether we should even hope for that or not, but Kobe Bird will be with us supposedly on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we've got two amazing authors who are going to be with us. Uh, one of them, uh, the, it's the book, The In Sync Child. And then Lee Meriday Porch is going to be here with us as she's got a new book out. She's an amazing mom blogger, hilarious, so amazing. And um, she's got a new book out. And I, I guess that there's a there's a part in the book about she was scheduled to be on Autism Live many, many years ago. And it was that day, that day that we all have where, you know, nothing can happen. And um, I haven't I haven't read that section of the book yet. I can't wait to hear. Um, but apparently, um, she was not able to be with us that day because her life was calling. Uh, and of course, you know, life goes on, but finally, finally, all these years later, we're going to have Lee on and she can tell us, uh, all about her new book, which is really wonderful. I want to thank all of you for being here with us and uh, for 
being a part of this conversation with Dr. Grant. And please uh, tune in tomorrow when we have asked Dr. Doreen. And don't forget, there'll be more of Dr. Grandin live on that Ed Talk on the 26th of April at the Ed Asner Family Center. So we'll look forward to seeing all of you then. I'll be back tomorrow with Dr. Grandin, and, or not Dr. Grandin, I'll be back with Dr. Grand Pichet. Uh, that'll be tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.